Okay. So um, this is uh, so just to begin with to uh, sort of orient you with some of the kind of problem or the class of problem we're interested in. It's uh, mostly inspired by, in this particular case, insect flight. Now, it's not a singular case. Uh, if you think about how living species move, uh, whether it's birds, insects, or fish, uh, they locomote in fluid. So the question is, a natural question one might ask is, how do they do it, and uh, do they do it efficiently? And uh, can we try to understand some basic physical principles governing uh, this uh, sort of behavior. Now, uh, the, although uh, they manifest themselves in uh, different contexts, but the underlying uh, physical, uh, the mathematical equation, or the physics is the same, essentially Newton's law, and in the continuum limit, and in this case is described by Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, so there are two parts to the problem. One is this continuum medium we're living in, fluid, whether it's air or water. And the other is this moving surface. So in this particular case, it's a piece of paper. And if I drop, it moves in air in a seemingly unpredictable manner. And uh, so if this is an insect wing, it, what an insect likes to do is to control it so that it can generate the right amount of force to stay in air or to turn and to, uh, to move, I hope, I mean, one of the questions we want to find out is whether they move it efficiently as well. So uh, the approach we're going to take, uh, what I uh, will focus on in this talk are computational. That is, we want to understand how the uh, motion of the fluid, which in this case is pushed by this moving surface, uh, affects the motion of the moving surface. So the, it essentially is a coupled system. The dynamics of this piece of paper is coupled to the unsteady flow, in this case, air. Now, if you look at this piece of paper, it's relatively small, but that's a little bigger than bird wing or a fish fin or a little bigger than the insect wing. So the typical uh, uh, Reynolds number for those of you who heard of that, uh, heard about Reynolds number, uh, governing uh, insects and uh, uh, birds uh, 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 about the order of 100 to uh, 10,000 uh, most. And so this is sort of in the middle range of the Reynolds number. So it's neither in the microfluidics, if, if some of you might be working on that, and that's a Stokes flow, nor is it in the uh, limit of the airplanes, that's uh, essentially inviscid flow. So we're sort of in this middle range of fluid dynamics where the flow is rather unsteady because it's coupled by the dynamics of this piece of paper, and we like to understand that problem. Okay, so, so what I'm gonna do next is to focus on a, spe a specific example which I'm most fascinated by, which is dragonfly flight, and we go from there. I'm trying to understand, uh, by the pr in the process of trying to understand a dragonfly flight, hopefully we'll deduce some general lessons. So, um, the uh, computational method I'll be focusing on today is mostly done by uh, my postdoc, Shan Shu, and uh, I will talk about, just mention briefly some of the results on falling paper, which you saw, and also some results on dragonfly flight. And so for the falling paper, it was done by, uh, uh, in collaboration with Umberto, who's a graduate student, honest is a postdoc, and uh, David Russell uh, was a former uh, PhD student. And if I have time, I'll sort of end up with the picture you saw early that uh, I uh, worked with uh, Childress, uh, Cowan, and Pesky. So um, the first thing you might ask is, so in this case, I should, uh, let's see if movie plays. So here's the familiar dragon flying. So what this does for you is just to slow it down a little bit, and this is the classical or the uh, typical hovering posture of a dragonfly. So when it hovers, the body lies more or less horizontal, and the wing uh, flap up and down. And uh, another thing you ought to notice is that the dragonfly has two pairs of wings, and uh, uh, depending on the uh, different maneuver, these wings might have uh, different phase uh, relations. So sometime in phase, in particular to take off or in hover, when in this case the wing's moving up and down out of phase. 
we'll look at this a little bit closer uh, later on. But just to contrast with uh, dragonfly flight, here's another picture we took in the lab uh, to look at the takeoff of butterfly. Now, butterfly also has two pairs of wings, but in this case, the two pairs of wings move as if it's one wing, right? So the fore and the hind wing doesn't have this independent degree of freedom and when they take off. And so the butterflies, you, many of you have seen, of course, and sort of flap like a, a Chinese, big Chinese fan back and forth like that. And uh, so um, what we want to do next is to s ask, well, if we want to understand the forces, for example, on this uh, insect, uh, we first have to look what the wing, how the wing moves. And so what we do is rather crudely, I would say, say uh, sort of catch the dragonfly in the field and uh, stick them on the post. And uh, <laughs> done by my student. And um, so here's a, a sort of a, a fast speed uh, uh, video of this at uh, 16 or 1500 frames per second. So uh, the typical scale we, you are looking at is the dragonfly wing has a, a typical length scale about one centimeter. And the tip velocity is about meter per second. And that's actually pretty typical of all the speed of locomotion. So if we walk, we walk at about meter per second. If we swim, we swim at about meter per second. So that's a typical locomotion speed. And uh, the frequency, the wing beats, is about uh, 40 hertz. And that varies from species to species. Uh, so birds flap a little slower on the order of hertz. And uh, hummingbirds a little higher, 50 to 80 hertz. And uh, fruit flies about 200 hertz. And the highest one is probably 900 hertz. So the smaller it gets, the uh, higher the frequency. And so as I mentioned before, in this particular case, uh, the Reynolds number is about 1,000. So what we do is we try to get to a, a 3D kinematics by using a single camera. So what we do is we put a mirror here. And so we have a, the camera is looking at two view. One is the dragonfly itself. And the other is the mirror image of itself. So by doing a little bit of a, a geometry, you can deduce uh, from these two images what the 3D kinematics is. So here is what you find. So you can track. So imagine, So as you can see from this movie, uh, dragonfly wings are relatively rigid. So if you have a rigid uh, plate and it's moving uh, hinged at the root, so there's three degrees of freedom, so sort of Euler angle, and so you can track these three uh, degree of freedom and uh, figure out exactly what the wing is doing. And so what I'm doing, showing you here, is just a projection. That is, if I have a wing extended in the 3D direction, what I do is I cut in along what's called a chord direction and ask you to or I will trace along this two-dimensional space what the uh, trajectory of this wing uh, in one period. All right? So that's plotted here. So roughly speaking, as you saw earlier, it's moving up and down. But in the meantime, it's coupled to this wing rotation. That is, you're moving down by pushing the air down, and you pitch it up and a lift. Right? So sort of a intuitively sensible thing to do if you want to stay in air. Uh, but moreover, what we can do is here are the input in some sense to the uh, computational method, which uh, I will describe later. But this is the input. This is what you see uh, in, say, a dragonfly like so. And we ask, what kind of flow does it generate and what kind of forces does it experience? So I'll start by just briefly mention the simplest possible uh, computational method you might consider. And this is indeed how I tried first. So I say, OK, real insects are complicated. But nonetheless, I would like to understand some of the basic uh, physical mechanisms. So what I'm going to do is very simple. I will consider only one wing. And uh, I will not be so concerned about the wing geometry like an airfoil. If you design an airfoil, you would be. But uh, here seems to me the most interesting thing or the significant part is the motion or the dynamics of the wing itself. So I simplify the geometry. If you prefer, you can have an airfoil. But in this case, it's a symmetric uh, ellipse. And so what you can do next is to say, I either prescribe the motion 
as you know, as you would have observed in field, or you can imagine you can drive this wing by uh, prescribing a force. And uh, then we, what we end up doing is we solving this Navier-Stokes equation. You should ignore these terms for now. They come from the non-inertial term. That is, I transform myself in the co-moving frame. But let's not worry about that. So Navier-Stokes equation essentially says uh, F equal to ma, so the fluid momentum is conserved. And also, it's a reasonably good, I think it's a very good uh, assumption uh, to assume it's an incompressible fluid dynamics because the velocity is one meter per second, as I mentioned before. And, what you, and then you have a boundary condition. That boundary is given uh, from the observation. So early this morning, somebody mentioned about uh, um, sort of body uh, uh, a mesh uh, adapt to the body. So here's a sort of a simple, relatively simple example of that. So in 2D, this is, was a simple geometry that's particularly simple. Uh, so if you have an ellipse, uh, the natural coordinates uh, to use is the elliptic coordinates. And that can be uh, related to just like any conformal coordinates uh, mapped back to a uh, uh, Cartesian coordinates. So uh, the advantage of using an elliptic coordinates, as you can see here, is that you naturally adapt your uh, mesh around the tip. So one of the uh, sort of the, the most important place to resolve, if you want to simulate how this piece of paper fall, is not so much the, near the ceiling, but exactly where this sharp edge is. So uh, this sort of a, a uh, the conformal grad uh, does this naturally for us. And so this is uh, what you've seen before, uh, in the conformal map, and that's the classical map. And if I can write down the Navier-Stokes equation in this conformal map, it's more or less the same as the original Navier-Stokes equation. And here I'm writing everything in terms of the stream function and the vorticity. So the vorticity is the curl of the uh, velocity and uh, we can solve this system. So the way I'm going to solve this, because it's a single body, I'm solving it in the co-rotating uh, frame and uh, solving this equation uh, uh, subject to the boundary condition. And the underlying finite difference scheme is a fourth order in time and space, and that was by Ian Liu in 1996. So what I did is to adapt that uh, for the uh, conformal map. And so here's a simulation of a generic wing moving up to down in a generic dragonfly motion. So the red indicates the positive vorticity and the blue is negative vorticity. And so here's a down up motion and this is the flow it creates. Right? So once you see the flow, you say, aha, there is gonna be a lift. Now why is that? It is as if this wing, by this combination of a up and a down motion and a rotational motion, it constantly tosses this down, this pair of vortices, which carries the fluid momentum. And by Newton's third law, this wing ought to experience the fluid. So it pushes the air down in this particular form for this, uh, 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 for this particular case. Uh, but intuitively, you immediately get the idea that is the, what insects sort of Gener uh, roughly speaking, what an insect wing uh, does is to find some kind of motion, uh, and the end result of that kind of motion is to create a downward jet, downward fluid jet. And so this is a um, closer look of uh, that process. So uh, this is the, the uh, dipole, in, dipole meaning a pair of plus and a, a positive and negative vortices appear together, and they, if they're close to each other, they induce flow and they co-move. And if this is a 3D, you can imagine this is a cross-section of a donut. So in 3D, if you look at the experiment, you're more likely to uh, uh, observe a vortex ring, like a smoke ring, uh, classical picture vortex ring. Okay, so uh, I don't know how many of you heard this myth, and uh, many of people uh, often sort of said jokingly, they say, okay, bumblebees cannot fly according to conventional aerodynamics. Um, but so the, in, in this particular case, one can say, okay, so how much force do you get in this rather relatively simple uh, 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 system? And so you can calculate the forces and the, uh, in this two-dimensional uh, simulation and the 
and you can figure out the forces and compare it with the uh, insect weight. So this much is how one starts to sort of a model, trying to get some basic picture of uh, the fluid motion as a result of a, a flappy motion. And uh, of course, I, I probably have said this before, but if you haven't heard, I don't trust computers. So uh, I don't think, I mean, the computers should not be trusted always. So, um, so the next question you ask is, yes, here you have a simulation. How well does it compare with the experiments? And so it is, now, it is possible, especially in now, uh, at these relatively low Reynolds numbers. So here, for example, uh, is a robotic wing um, done by uh, Dickinson's group. Uh, they are driving this uh, wing back and forth, and you can use the uh, uh, what's called a particle image velocimetry to measure the flow field and deduce the vorticity field. And so that's possible, and we can calculate that using the same computational method, and you can say, okay, let's compare the uh, vorticity field uh, in the computation and in the experiment and to see how well they agree. So this is sort of an exercise one is able to do now. And so here's one example of such. So for example, here's the computed vorticity for a back and a forth moving uh, wing and this is the experimentally measured. And you can try to uh, uh, figure out how much difference is there, or how much similarity is there. And you can do a little bit more. You can compare, compare the forces. So these are the uh, uh, computa computed forces and the experimental force is the thick dashed line. So you can do for this for many cases and trying to get a sense whether this kind of a two-dimensional modeling, I said it's sort of relatively the simplest thing one should be start working and how close that might get you to uh, a model in some sense or give you some clue about the actual forces experienced by uh, this 3D wing in a real tank. Okay. So that's sort of a one exercise or one uh, investigation that is you say I look at simple wing, I, I try to simplify as much as I can and uh, uh, see uh, what we've learned. So the next thing uh, uh, goes, the next thing I want to look is for especially it's sort of interesting in terms of a dragonfly flight, uh, they do have two pairs of wing, and uh, uh, so the natural question is, do they interact, and what kind of interaction do you have? And the same kind of interaction uh, question you would ask about, say, birds, they flap, uh, they move in formation, and uh, uh, swimming uh, fish in school, a uh, school of swimming fish, and so on. So there's a, another class of a problem which is trying to understand the interaction between these different multiple flapping bodies. Now the method that I just described won't work there. It's, uh, it's meant to design for a single wing. So we have to do something different. So uh, just to explain this I've already mentioned, that is the dragonfly wing. So you sort of get it. So the first question is, is this a problem worth our study, right? So there are hundreds, hundreds of problems out there. And uh, uh, so first I want to sort of get a sense, maybe there is an interaction, right? So after all the hard work, maybe I find that there's no interaction. So there's an indication that there is an interaction. So here's a, a, a reason why. So uh, just anecdotally, uh, uh, Rupo is a biologist, that he has been observing uh, the uh, uh, dragonfly behavior for a long time, and what he noticed is that when the dragonfly take off, there's some generic feature. Dragonfly take off, they tend to flap uh, in sync, and when they hover, they tend to flap uh, out of sync. So obviously, they do use different strategies. This is an indication that the phase matters, right, depending on the maneuver. So it's a question worth looking, I thought. And uh, so this is method I'll just move, move uh, uh, th so we've tried two methods. And so this is the method uh, David Russell did for his thesis. So the idea is we want to be able to simulate these multiple rigid bodies moving uh, in fluid. And so the, in this case, uh, essentially we're again using the vorticity and stream function formulation. And except now we are uh, treating the presence of the rigid bodies or the collection of these interfaces as the discontinuities in the fluid equation. And so there's a question how do we implement them and so on and so forth. 
But uh, what I really like to focus on to some detail is the next method, which is I immerse interface method. And this is meant to uh, simulate multiple bodies, and uh, uh, including both the rigid and the flexible ones uh, moving in uh, fluid. And so the history, or the, just a brief history of the immerse interface method, it's, uh, it's a, sort of a, it came from uh, the uh, immerse, or it's a further development of immerse boundary method, so to speak, and which uh, has been around for almost 30 some years. Uh, 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 initially, uh, the, uh, the, the basic idea is that when you have an interaction of uh, fluid and solid, um, uh, uh, one uh, treats the fluid as a continuum medium, uh, uh, ignoring the uh, solid uh, or the uh, uh, whatever uh, object you may have. And so the, the, the solid comes in uh, in the, or the, ex the, 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 the example I described before in most other numerical methods is to enter as a boundary condition. That is, the, if the, if the no slip boundary condition. So at the solid surface, uh, the velocity is zero. But equivalently, this is with Peskin's idea, equivalently, uh, you can, I think this is a little differently, that is, instead of uh, enforcing this uh, of the lo uh, boundary condition along the interface, you can view that there's a singular distribution of the forces along the surface, and effectively, the effective row is stop the fluid, right, across the surface. So, so this is a, a different way of thinking about it. So instead of, uh, Enforcing the boundary condition, what you end up is you add a distribution, the singular for distribution of the singular force to the Navier-Stokes equation, and that singular force is has to be constructed somehow, which I'll get into in a little while. So the method has been quite robust and it's being applied to uh, many uh, systems. Uh, what I originally designed for was the blood uh, in heart. Uh, one of the uh, difficulty uh, in the method, or one of the places one like to improve upon, is the uh, resolution or the accuracy of resolving this interface. Uh, so the, in the original method, this interface, as I said, there's a singular force distribution. So imagine you have a distribution of a delta function along the interface. And so the question is, how do you interpolate between uh, this uh, interface to the underlying grids, and the interface is parameterized by the uh, Lagrangian points, and these are the Cartesian uh, grid, grid. So there's, uh, so the, in the classical method is you uh, sort of approximate this delta function by some finite size delta function, which would depend on the grid size, right? So if your grid, uh, a delta function has a finite support of two or three, four grids, that would affect uh, affect the uh, uh, the the uh, sorry the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 resolution of the interface. So what uh, Randy, as uh, as you heard uh, him talking today, had also done uh, proposed and his collaborator proposed a different way of treating this uh, delta function. And it initially was proposed for the Stokes flow and elliptic equations. And that is, instead of uh, approximating this delta function, let's say, uh, by uh, uh, some finite approximation, uh, uh, you, uh, in, you instead treating this interface as a discontinuity in your uh, 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 fluid equation, in, uh, in your whatever original equation is. So the question is, how do you come up with treating or incorporating these uh, discontinuous functions to the right order or of accuracy as your underlying solver? So if the underlying solver is second order, you better approximate this interface also to the second order. Right? So this has been uh, uh, worked over the last 10 years. And, uh, uh, and, and including a simulation of a 2D Navier-Stokes equation. So what we have done is trying to come up with a systematic way of treating this, uh, deriving these all the necessary uh, jump conditions and uh, inter uh, include them sort of correctly in the, uh, in the numerical methods. So uh, in terms of, so what you now should imagine is that I have a continuous uh, sort of fluid in uh, the uh, uh, in space, uh, 
And along the interface, I would have these uh, discon discontinuities. And that discontinuities is in the derivative velocity and it is in pressure and the, all the high derivative of those quantities. Right? So to begin with, uh, if we look at the velocity, and the velocity is continuous. So, so the velo if, you, if you have a solid moving in fluid, at the solid surface, the velocity is the same as the velocity of the solid. That's a no-slip boundary condition. However, the normal derivative of velocity is not, and that is essentially related to the shear force on the surface, and that shear force will be then balanced by this singular force on the interface. Right? So the pressure, similarly, the pressure has to be, this is all, you, so how we derive this is you take a, a sort of a, a, a small sheet of this discontinuous surface and then you basically write down the uh, force balance. And so the normal force has to be balanced by the pressure discontinuity. And the uh, uh, pressure, uh, the, 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 the jump condition in the uh, gradient of the pressure is related to the divergence of this pressure. So that comes from Gaussian, Gauss law, or Gauss uh, theorem. So these are the uh, first few terms of, it was initially derived also by Lyon and Lee and we use a slightly more uh, general method for doing the same. So another thing we did is to say, what, okay, so the method we're gonna inc uh, implement, we're gonna use to implement this is a finite difference scheme so for a given desired order of accuracy, how many jump conditions do we need? And how do we derive them systematically? So before you saw the jump conditions in terms of the, the principal jump condition comes from the force balance, but what if I want to know the uh, jump conditions in terms of a second order uh, derivative of velocity, what should I do? So here's, a, so, in, so if you're interested in that, this is uh, explained there. Uh, so uh, just to uh, summarize, so if you want to have a first order finite difference scheme, so Navier-Stokes equation, the highest order of a de spatial derivative is second order, that's a viscous term. So in order to get a first order a finite difference for that viscous term, you need the jump conditions in terms of velocity and the up to its second velocity, and the same for pressure. And if you want to do the second order scheme, you have to do uh, you also have to know the jump conditions of the third order derivative, okay, and so on and so forth. So once we can derive all this based on, essentially based on starting from the principal jump condition in addition uh, with the uh, Navier-Stokes equation, take the derivatives of the Navier-Stokes equation and manipulate, and that's what Shen did, and you find all the necessary uh, spatial jump conditions, uh, uh, you can derive all of them. And another thing uh, we noticed is that you, there's also a temporal jump condition, and this is very easy to understand. So if you have an interface, if I stand here and uh, there is a bubble coming toward me, uh, at a time t, uh, t uh, it's on this side, at time t plus, it's gonna be on the other side. So if, I'm, I, if you look at, the, uh, at any given spatial point, there is a temporal uh, discontinuity, a temporal jump as well as a spatial continuity, but the, these two quantities are related, so we can derive that. Uh, so this is probably the last slide I'll talk about the method. So now we know all the jump conditions, theoretically, uh, what, uh, that needs to go into this method, and so then you say, okay, how do I implement this uh, finite difference scheme? And the finite difference scheme is no other than Taylor expansion. So I'll just give you an example of a 1D Taylor expansion. So 1D Taylor expansion, normally everybody knows that. So this is the first part of the Taylor expansion. So for if you have a, a piecewise a discontinuous function, uh, you can generalize this Taylor expansion by including the uh, derivatives, uh, the jump conditions of the, all, all the derivatives of this function at these points, right? So you can easily derive this. You can derive this for if you have one jump condition, uh, one discontinuous function, and if you sum up with all the uh, possible discontinu discontinuous points, and that's, your, that's this uh, generalized Taylor expansion. So that's absolutely the uh, basis for writing down all the finite differences for the method. So if you want to write down the uh, 
uh, the first derivative of u with respect to dx. This is your usual uh, central difference scheme. And uh, on top of that, if there is a discontinuity in the middle of that stencil, uh, and then in the middle of that interval, then you have to also take into account uh, the jump conditions as given by the Taylor expansion. Right? So you can work out this stuff. But that's just one example. So what I want to do next is just to show you, once you put everything together, uh, what kind of results one can get with this method. Uh, just briefly, um, the, the spatial discretization is done in max schemes. This is a in formula in terms of velocity and the pressure. Uh, so we use max scheme in uh, space. In time, we use Rangakata, uh, fourth order Rangakata scheme. And the reason for doing that is we can then use an explicit scheme to ensure the stability uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this numerical scheme. And for the Lagrangian points, you, uh, in order to parameterize this interface, we use a cubic spline. So uh, the first thing we tested is we say, okay, let's try something that we actually know the analytic answer. So if you have a taylor Kuwait flow, which is essentially two cons uh, concentric cylinder rotating at different speed, then one can write down a family of solution, well, a solution uh, between this, right? So axiosymmetric solutions. And so using that analytic solution, you can test the order of accuracy of your numerical scheme. And this is the results. So you, we, when you, when, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the error we're looking here is the infinity norm, which is essentially the maximum of uh, error, which is along the interface. So we really care about how well we resolve uh, the interface. And so there are not exactly two, but close to two. Right? So this is much better than what's uh, being done in, uh, in the immersed boundary method, that is, uh, uh, was one and a formula two, but here you can get uh, close to uh, uh, two. And also you can look at the uh, volume conservation, which is uh, also a much uh, improved as seen in also at the immersed interface method. And the classical test one does with, uh, I think, any numerical method, or at least the Fornavia Stokes hour, is flow past the cylinder. So here is a flow past a cylinder at Reynolds number 200. And uh, so you say, what should we measure? We measure the lift. Oh, we, in this case, lift is going up and down. You measure the lift and the drag, and you compare with the previous results, and you measure the frequency of this wake, and that's called a, uh, the Struho number. So you do that for 100 and 200. And they all compare pretty well with the uh, previous results. And you say, OK, I look, want to look a little bit more. Uh, at a lower Reynolds number, if it's 20 or 40, and then the wake is stable. So the previously 200, the wake has this von Kármán wake. Uh, at the lower Reynolds number, you expect to have this bubble, trailing bubble behind this uh, cylinder. And you also know, uh, have an experimental measurement where this uh, separation occur, right? So that's a stagnation point. So those are the two quantities, the size of the bubble and where the stagnation point is, or where the separation point is is experimentally measurable, so you can compare the numerics with that. And so again, this is uh, the uh, current with the, the previous, and again, uh, falls in that range. Then you say, okay, I want to look more. Uh, and so you, uh, in an another even uh, closer look of this is you ought to be able to uh, look at the vorticity distribution along the cylinder and the pressure along the cylinder. That's another thing people have measured. Uh, 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 for cylinder, and so here are the uh, numerics, which is solid curve, and uh, these are the dots, which are the uh, uh, experimental curve uh, done uh, some years ago. So, uh, so these are the various uh, things uh, we thought uh, uh, we should at least look, and uh, and they turn at least. So by this point, I think I'm reasonably happy. Oh, I should be pretty happy. So uh, coming back then, that was just a test for uh, the numerical solver itself. So this is using this now new method to simulate the same wing which I talked, showed you earlier, the first picture where I have a single wing moving at but down, where you see this uh, shedding of vortex uh, dipoles. And this is, again, sort of to just double check and confirm that we are actually getting something that we know. And then we come to this Finally, so I'll come back to this 
uh, physical question that is, is there interactions? And now we have this computational method. Uh, how do we understand uh, the, uh, such an interaction? So here's, for example, in a simulation of two wings. So these are the two wings, and they're moving in sync. And so uh, one of the uh, uh, sort of natural thing to look at is what is the effect of the phase delay between the four and a hind wing on the force generation and so on. So um, we have we've been currently looking at this, but we uh, what I'm going to show you now is the simulational results use the previous method, which was done by uh, David Russell. Uh, so here again is the two uh, uh, two wing moving uh, uh, in a, you, uh, following the uh, kinematics which I talked about earlier, uh, which came from the uh, experiments. So this is. Uh, exact 3D kinematics project on the, to this 2D plane. And here is the vorticity field they create. And the Reynolds number here is about a thousand. And because we have a relatively small grid, so you actually see the vortices being bounced off here a little bit. But uh, essentially, uh, due to the wing motion alone, they push air down. So uh, the next question uh, we want to know is, how does the Reynolds number affect uh, the simulation or the results. So uh, let's compare, say, 200 and uh, a thousand. And as you would expect, a lower Reynolds number, uh, the flow, dif uh, uh, the, because the viscosity is a little higher, so it diffuses momentum a little bit faster. So you tend to get these uh, the results which are smeared over a larger. So the typical scale, shall we say, the, is a little bit larger than the final scale you see at a higher Reynolds number. And so if you just look at these two simulations, you see, aha, they look very different, right? So you, are, you might expect the forces might be very different there. But it, however, this is not quite the case. So if you compare the forces on uh, the two wing as a function of time for these two cases, uh, uh, they actually follow each other reasonably well. So that is, this is sort of an impression one gets by just looking at the picture. doesn't really tell you the uh, actual force uh, exper experienced by these two wings. But another side effect of this is it's actually a good news. That is, we can look at, we can simulate at a relatively lower Reynolds number. This is a lower Reynolds number than the actual dragonfly and trying to get some general lessons because this is much faster to simulate. Uh, so the, in the experiment, one thing I didn't mention is, in fact, we also put a force transducer, which measures uh, the vertical force component as a way to calibrate our computation. So here I just want to show you some of the results. So when a dragonfly wing moves up and down, what we've been calculating or computing is the fluid force, and that's purely aerodynamic. But there's another force, what's called inertia force. That's the force required to accelerate this wing up and down. So uh, we can look and uh, compare the relative magnitude. So the blue curve is the CFD, which is the uh, aerodynamic force, and the inertial force is this uh, purple. Now the inertial force, the amount of force to accelerate, deaccelerate weight is not zero, but average to zero, right? So if uh, uh, it, this is true for any periodic motion. <coughs> uh, and then uh, you, if you add these two components together, and that's the force, uh, measured experimentally, and so uh, we can try to lay uh, this on top of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the experiments and try to get a sense uh, whether the computer force uh, uh, is reasonable. So those are the, uh, the things which, uh, so, so, uh, so then the next thing, natural thing to do is you say vary, you vary the different, uh, uh, the phase and so on, and trying to look at the force as a function of this uh, phase variation. And the answer turned out to be uh, rather disappointing, and that is the force actually doesn't uh, depend on the phase variation. So I thought, why? But so the next thing that occurred to me, I said, okay, so perhaps it's not the force. Uh, we should look the actual work being consumed or the power consumption uh, depending on the phase uh, uh, coupling. So it turned out it is not the force that such a phase affected, but the power that's affected 
by this phase, which is sort of interesting if you think about it. That is, the, you, you sh in, 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 in hovering, you don't really, uh, all you need, the, the, the amount of force you need to generate is to balance the weight, so that's fixed. So whatever you do, you should at least meet this minimum criteria to balance the force. So that's a good strategy in a sense. Doesn't matter how you uh, 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 move your wing uh, relative to each other, you always uh, be able to support the weight, but there is a better way of doing it. Uh, there's a better way of doing it to save energy, that is this counter stroke in which is being observed in uh, as, as being observed uh, in real dragonfly fly. So that's a sort of an interesting finding. Uh, so the next thing, which uh, uh, is perhaps a little less obvious if by looking at this uh, video, uh, so uh, what you, uh, but uh, if you stare at this video for a very long time, what you might notice is that I mentioned the fact that the wing actually turns pitches about the, uh, the axial axis, and so uh, the the way it turns is that it turns at the tip first and then at the root, right? So that's a little counterintuitive. If you think about the active rotation, that is, imagine if the muscle wants to turn this wing and the muscle is here, therefore I would expect the turning happens here first and then propagates to the tip. But here what you observe is the opposite. So this indicates to me that in fact, this wing rotation is not entirely active, but rather passive. So how do you quantify this? You quantify this because we know exactly what the fluid force is, is as a function of time. You can calculate the torque, and uh, you can follow that during this whole uh, sequence. And you find, indeed, these large negative peaks, which corresponding, or which essentially says, indeed, it's a passive rotation. That is, the fluid torque tries to turn the wing. Now, so this brings me back to, so you say, okay, does this make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. The reason it makes sense is that the fluid torque does turn this piece of paper, as I showed earlier, right? So it pushes down, no, I, I, I'm not turning the paper, but the fluid torque does it. So in some sense, one can argue that perhaps the insect wing, when they move in air, they don't really have to do all that much work to turn. So this then brings back to this example. This is a, 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 a sort of a slowing that motion down for you. This is a tumbling uh, trajectory of a piece of paper. Then you, so so there are two things, that, that, two reasons why I we were interested in this. One is sort of relate to the question we've been addressing. That is how to understand this dynamic coupling between a moving surface and the unsteady flow, but also, so in some sense, that we're looking at a passive flight, flapping flight, if you like. And another reason we're looking at this is, here's in a, a sort of a beautifully simple experimental uh, setup, so let me explain why. And so if you um, are trying to understand a quantity, have another experimentally, if you want to understand these flapping flight, uh, one can uh, design a robo fly, uh, as in the case we've shown before. You prescribe the motion and you measure the forces. And uh, prescribe the motion, you have to have the motor. And to measure the forces, you have to have these force gauges. And so then, given the motion, you have the force. And uh, one hopefully, by looking, correlate these two come up with a, a model which describes the forces in terms of the motion. And so, and so I sort of want to suggest this as an alternative to that big experiment because we're theorists, right? So we have to be a little modest in setting up our own experiment. So here is an experiment which uh, sort of is a, bird, uh, a stone kills two birds. That is, if I follow the trajectory of this tumbling paper, I can deduce the motion simply by taking the derivatives. I can deduce the acceleration by taking second derivatives. And because it's a free system, a Newton's law says the gravity plus the fluid force is m times that acceleration. I know the gravity force, which is the weight of the paper, and I can measure the acceleration. Therefore, I can measure or deduce the fluid force.
So just by simply tracking this piece of paper, I measure the trajectory, I know exactly what the fluid force is. So in some sense, this provides a little sort of a, a lab experiment for us uh, to uh, deduce, uh, uh, sort of, uh, to do a flapping flight experiment and to deduce some forces. And so here is a little uh, tank, which is uh, just a simple uh, fish aquarium you buy from a pet store. And uh, uh, th this is an aluminum plate, uh, we, which we drop from the top. And it uh, sounds simple, but it takes a lot of work to do it well. Uh, and then we use this high-speed camera to follow the trajectory and so uh, sufficiently sort of uh, fine resolution so we can take second order derivatives, therefore deducing the forces. And so uh, this, uh, well, come back to this. Uh, the next thing you might want to ask is, what does the flow field look like? We can put some dye in it and see the vorticity field, or we can use the, uh, uh, the method I was describing uh, to actually simulate this and therefore we get the full measurement of the vorticity field as well as the pressure field. And you separate the pressure force and the viscous force and you can sort of really beat the problem to death, so to speak. So that was the experimental setup which I was describing. So here's your little fish tank and uh, we monitor the trajectory. And so the trajectory depending on the alumin, uh, so there's basically uh, three parameters describing the, this system. Uh, the Reynolds number, the thickness ratio, and the dimensionless moment of inertia. And if you vary them, and you can uh, vary the trajectory from the tumbling motion, which you saw before, and uh, the flutter motion, which is rocking back and forth. And for these, and or sometimes more interestingly, uh, are these sort of seemingly chaotic trajectories. So there are loads of questions you can ask now. So if you're interested in dynamic consistency, you might ask, how does one state transit to the other state? And, uh, uh, or the, the, uh, the kind of question we were sort of also interested in, which is deducing some simple ODE models for this. So now let's look at uh, the, uh, so the simulation here is a little different, uh, same uh, basic numerical method, except now the motion of the body is governed by this couple system. So I don't prescribe the motion, but the motion is determined by the fluid force plus the gravity, right? So here is an example of this tumbling motion, and uh, that's the wake it's shared by this. And uh, here's another example, which is the flutter motion, and uh, again, that's the wake shared by that. So um, sort of a two, uh, I think uh, I will sort of uh, just to briefly mention, so in this case, uh, the interesting thing is that after you uh, figure out what the fluid force is on this, it turns out it's not quite you expected. So let's go back even, uh, so here. So here as this uh, wing, if you wish, rocking down, most portion is gliding, right? So it's gliding and a turn and a glide and turn, glide and turn. So naively, you would expect during the gliding portion, the fluid force is more or less given by the force on a gliding airfoil, a gliding plate, because it has a small angle of attack, and so that is the force is going to be proportional to velocity squared times the Kutta-Shukowski uh, lift, which is sine alpha. But that's not the case at all. So what we find is that the force acting on this, uh, uh, this plate is dominated by the term, which is not velocity squared, but it's the coupling, which is the velocity times another velocity scale, which is this angular velocity, right? So it's both in the case of the tumbling, and it's also in the case of this uh, 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 flutter motion. Now that's sort of interesting. It's interesting because partly you, you see something that you didn't expect, but another sort of side interest is that if we go back to this original picture, uh, there's a, an interesting uh, thing which I sort of didn't mention. And if you look at the trajectory of this piece of paper, when it tumbles, uh, it falls down during the gliding portion, but there is a cusp 
where it rises just momentarily. So if you track the center of mass, it goes up a little bit and then glides some and it goes up a little bit. So when you next time see how leaves fall and uh, every once in a while it picks up a little bit and you think maybe there's a little bit of gust. No, in fact, you don't need a, a gust for this uh, piece of leaf to lift it itself a little bit. Now, okay, so that's true, you observe that. And uh, so now putting everything together, this now makes sense, why? If, I did, if the fluid force is indeed governed by this velocity square, let's say fluid force is uh, proportional to velocity square, you wouldn't expect this. So that it well goes up, but it constantly descending, so you would never get the center of mass elevation. Because near the uh, turning point, the translational velocity is approaching zero, so that the force goes to zero as velocity squared. On the other hand, if you have a force which is velocity times angular velocity, and as it's tumbling, <coughs> as it approaches to this cusp, and the force is linearly proportional to you, if you only include that in your ODE model, you would get this rise of the falling paper. So that's sort of interesting. So, so in a sense, by sort of really scrutinizing a very simple uh, sort of a system, just a falling paper, everybody's seen it. Uh, but there's quite a lot of uh, interesting things. Uh, it tells you a lot more about uh, the fluid forces in this case, which is sort of interesting in a sense. If we want to write down some simple model of fluid forces, maybe uh, it's not quite right, even though when you see the motion is more or less uh, in the gliding motion, you would assume it might be appropriate to use the Shukowski, but it's not quite the case as shown by this example. Okay, so I've sort of talked to you about two examples. One is you look at the dragonflies and they're trying to figure out what the flows and what the, uh, why do they do certain things, for example, why do they move the wing and out of face when they hover and then which uh, we also look in a sort of completely opposite extreme, that is take the thorax away and just let this wing sort of fall in a tumble. And then from that we try to deduce some simple model of the uh, fluid forces. And uh, there's uh, something we uh, want to end on, which is uh, how about if it's something in between, which is what insects really do, that is, they are driven by the muscles, and the muscle moves this wing, which could be flexible or rigid, and this wing is immersed in fluid. So here's the three uh, things uh, coupled together. And this is something I have been exploring uh, using the immersed boundary method. It's just a way of uh, sort of a simulate that system. So you have some muscles uh, in the middle, and uh, the, uh, the white are the elastic network uh, to simulate the wing, and the red are the fluid. So I'll just show you one example, which sort of give the first picture. So here, I was experimenting to make a relatively uh, a rigid plate, and also put the muscles in the middle, and so what I do is uh, periodically drive this force, and so that, and I want to figure out what would be the right way to drive this force so that this wing moves and up and down, at least in some way. So this is a, sort of a case where it shows you that it, I'm able to pull the wing up and down. Uh, here's a classical uh, sort of a experiment one can do, or it's sort of actually interesting to think about. That is, if I have a wing moving up and down like so, and uh, in fact, this is a unstable, uh, 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 unstable fixed points. Uh, I won't get into detail, but uh, in a sense, that is, if there's a headwind blow against the, uh, uh, this uh, wing, and what this wing will do is moving toward the headwind, right? So, uh, so if it's, there's a small perturbation in this direction, uh, in the uh, horizontal direction, it will move in that horizontal direction. So this is how you might want to think about the onset of these uh, flapping fly. And so what we do is trying to see if at least we can observe that in this context. And so uh, one can indeed uh, look at these Reynolds numbers and see how this uh, thrust occurs as a function of Reynolds number. <coughs> so I think I just used up uh, an hour and, uh, and hopefully this gives you some idea
what sort of, I think, interesting, fascinating uh, questions one can ask just uh, by looking, for example, out in the courtyard, there's a fountain, and uh, if you see, there are a lot of beautiful fishes, and, uh, and, uh, and, and normally you think these uh, uh, goldfish, they are sloppy and slow, but uh, if you actually stare them for a little while, you see they are able to turn, and they are able to accelerate in sort of a I, to me, in a pretty uh, amazing speed. So they are certainly using uh, some of the si similar mechanisms. Okay, so I'll end uh, with uh, this. So these are some of the driving questions, at least uh, for us, but it, it shouldn't be limited to that. So I, I'll end with that. And uh, there's a website if you want to read a bit more.